And today, the topic that I wanted to discuss with you is quite wide in scope. And the way that I'm going to approach this topic is rather roundabout. The topic is human nature. And in order to talk about human nature, I'm actually going to talk about silver foxes and bonobos. I know, right? Weird way to talk about humans. But before we get into it, I want to talk about human nature in general and how this term is used in popular culture or everyday conversation. Most of the time when I hear people talk about human nature, it's not in a flattering way. Oftentimes people will cite human nature as the culprit for our tribal and territorial behavior, for our greed and our self-interest. Now, to me, human nature means the things that make us uniquely human. In other words, when we talk about human nature, what we should be discussing are the traits or the qualities that are unique to humankind. If you talk about tribalism, territorialism, greed, and self-centeredness, I would argue that these are actually part of the nature of life and living organisms. These are traits of all living creatures. Every living creature is self-centered. They're focused on their own survival. And that self-interest may extend a little bit wider to include members of the pack, but it doesn't extend beyond that. I would argue that territorialism is also quite common in the animal world. It's not something that is uniquely human. Ditto with greed. I mean, any apex predator is going to be greedy in a sense. The lions don't share the gazelle with the hyenas. They keep the gazelle for themselves. So all of these things to me are not representative of human nature, but rather of animal nature. And so when we talk about human nature, we have to be careful because most of the time the traits described as being the result of human nature are actually traits which are found in all animals or in at least many different types of animals. Humans just being one of them. So now let's talk about what makes us uniquely human. And in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to cite a 40 year long experiment which was conducted in Russia. I don't have any of the particulars with me because my memory is horrible, but I was reading about this guy yesterday and what he did in a 40 year span is he began to domesticate silver foxes. Now this may be old news to you, but when I learned about this, it was mind blowing. What I learned is that the process of domestication is very simple. It's merely the breeding out of aggressive traits in a species. So when humans began to domesticate wolves many, many thousands of years ago, we were breeding them in captivity at first because they were still quite aggressive and hostile. Now, wolves had become accustomed to following groups of humans around because they learned. They learned that we were messy creatures and that we would leave behind all sorts of things that the wolves could scavenge and eat. And so their proximity to human groups naturally made them friendlier or at least less aggressive towards humans. That was the first step. The second step, though, is the part that is super cool to me these early humans, they were able to secure wolf pups and raising them in captivity. They were able to kill off the ones that were the most aggressive and they kept the pups that were the friendliest. Now the early humans did this for generation upon generation upon generation until the wolves began to change. The wolf pups began to change. They began to change in a physiological way, not just in a psychological or behavioral way. And this is what the Russian guy discovered when he started doing the same thing with silver foxes. He started breeding them in captivity, killing off the ones that showed the most aggression and keeping 
the ones who were the friendliest. And after 40 years, not 10,000, not 2,000, not even 100 years, after 40 years, the silver foxes looked different. Their ears were floppier. Their muzzles were shorter. These are the physiological changes that occur through domestication. Now let's move on to bonobos, because this is where things get even more interesting. Now, as you know, bonobos are very, very, very closely related to chimpanzees and therefore very closely related to humans. If you didn't know better and you just saw them in the wild, you might confuse a bonobo for a chimp because they look very, very similar, nearly identical in some ways. But when you study the two, you realize that they're very different. For instance, bonobos are virtually without aggression. They solve their problems with good old fashioned fucking. That's right, folks. Bonobos have sex, lots and lots of sex. And it's not for breeding purposes, or at least not strictly for breeding purposes. They actually have sex for enjoyment, to create bonds, to resolve conflict. And they go every which way, my friends. It's, it's something to behold. Uh, they're also the only species that we know of that has intercourse face to face. So again, very, very strange. And none of these traits are seen in the chimps. So you have these two very closely related animals, nearly identical in every regard, except their behavior is very different. The second piece of research that I wanna cite now is one about bonobos and this theory that they are self domesticating. The study basically highlights all of these traits in bonobos that are typically associated with the domestication of a species. But we're pretty damn certain that we haven't domesticated bonobos. So unless aliens came down and domesticated them, we have to assume that they are self-domesticating. Let that sink in for a second, folks. Self-domesticating. So if the domestication process is the breeding out of aggressive traits, and most of the time it's done externally, right? By one species to another, then how would you possibly explain self-domestication? There's something missing there because all domestication seems to involve two parties, the one that's being domesticated and the one that's doing the domestication. And in order for that to happen, the one who's doing the domestication has to have a slight edge in intellectual prowess. In other words, you have to kind of have a plan. You have to know what traits you're looking for in the species that you're domesticating, and then you have to make sure that you kill off those traits. So it requires a kind of deliberate intelligence that isn't found, or at least we don't think is found, in very many places in the animal kingdom. The reason that I want to talk about this and relate it to human nature is because I believe that we humans are self-domesticating. I believe that this is what led to our evolution and our rapid development in the last 200,000 years. See, I think that originally we were no different from chimps and bonobos, or at least very, very similar to them in appearance. And even now, we share 99% of our DNA with these species, so we're still very similar. But if you put us side by side, you're not going to confuse a human with a bonobo or a chimp. You might confuse a chimp and a bonobo, but you won't confuse the human because physiologically, we are very, very different from our closest ancestors, from our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. And I think that the traits that you find in humans the flatter face, the upright posture, all of these things have to do with our self-domestication. I don't think ancient aliens came down and domesticated us when we were still blissfully ignorant animals. I think that we did it to ourselves just like the bonobos have been doing to themselves. This is why I want to draw the parallel. If this theory is accurate and the bonobos are actually self-domesticating, and we know that's possible, and we know we're 99% related to the bonobos, then it stands to reason that this is what we did. This is why we're so different. Maybe we're ahead. Maybe we started doing it further back, and that's why we're like this, and the bonobos are still chimp-like. Maybe if we give the bonobos another 100,000 years, they will look 
very, very, very much like us. Because if they're allowed to continue self-domesticating, the next step in my totally uninformed and uneducated opinion, the next step is culture. And in chimps and bonobos, you already have the sort of foundations of culture, a proto-culture, if you will. It's a lot more simple. There's no symbolic language yet, but this is where the self-domestication process takes us in my, again, totally uninformed opinion based on two studies that I've read in the last few days. Um, I think that self-domestication eventually, if allowed to continue, will lead to the development of more complex social groups and social relationships. And this, of course, demands language, symbolic language, because in order to navigate the more complex social dynamic, you need to be able to communicate more precisely. And this requires language in the way that we understand it as humans, written, oral, symbolic language, whereby I make some noises with my mouth and you get these pictures in your head and you understand what I'm thinking. We can share our thoughts with language. So, you know, I, I doubt we'll ever figure out conclusively whether or not the bonobos are self-domesticating. I hope we find out. Um, the research that I read was very convincing and it actually, for me, connected a lot of dots that I hadn't yet put together. And the fact that humans are so vastly different from all these other animals, even though we're very closely related to all of them, not just chimps and bonobos. I mean, we share, I think, 50% of our DNA with trees, for God's sake. We're related to everything, but not everything has the ability to reflect on itself and to think of itself in an abstract way and to represent the universe as it is in this kind of way that we do it with symbols and labels and categories. Like, so, so for me, the self-domestication hypothesis is very compelling. It's very interesting. And it lines up with something I've said in these videos before and something else that I believe, which is that humans are self-conditioning. Basically means the same thing in a way. Or maybe one leads to the other. The ability to self-domesticate also allows you to self-condition. But uh, what I mean is that most animals are conditioned by their biology and by their environment, right? Nature and nurture. And in the human world, we talk about nature and nurture. But I think one thing that is overlooked is this ability to not only ignore, but go against your biology. Not only ignore, but go against your environment and do the opposite of what it is conditioning you to do. This is self-conditioning. You're not being conditioned by nature. You're not being conditioned by your body. You're being conditioned by yourself. You're choosing a path and you're going, this is my goal. This is the person I wanna be. And I don't care if the world around me is telling me otherwise. I don't care if my body is wanting to go the other direction. Using my willpower, I'm going to resist these forces and I'm going to condition myself to be the kind of person that I wanna be. So whether you call it self-conditioning or self-domestication makes no difference. When the cognitive device of an animal gets to this level of complexity, it becomes like a mirror and it turns around on itself and it creates this weird reflective process whereby we become aware of ourselves in a different way. I mean, animals are aware of themselves, you know, as creatures in space and time. They're aware of their surroundings, but they don't think of themselves the way humans do. So... I think it all connects somehow, but I'm not a scientist or a biologist. I'm just some dude in a van talking to his phone. So, you know, if you have any data on this or any information that I don't, or if you can correct me on some of this stuff, I would be quite appreciative because like I said, I don't know shit, but I find it interesting and I like to speculate. So I thought I would share my speculations with you today. Hope you have a good day, my friends. Hope you are successful in your self-domestication, self-conditioning today. Hope you tame yourself. Hope you take charge of your life. Hope you live well.